with us. Remember the message was it Wednesday night? Have mercy on us. Have mercy on me. I'll have mercy on you. Uh, we're, we're, we're giving you the, we're giving you some extra steps and exercise this morning. Take your Bible, please go to first Samuel. If you will turn with us to first Samuel, it is odd not having a handshaking time, isn't it? And the ushers aren't even where they're supposed to be. We're going to have to do some more recruiting. My goodness, it is different and that's okay. It's the new normal for a little while. We'll get back to normal, normal before we know it. I'm sure. Praise the Lord. And uh, 1 Samuel chapter number 3, please. And we're going to read together. I'll ask you to join me on verses 9 and 10. I'll begin by reading verse 8. <clears throat> Got this bug. Sorry about this. I've been fighting. I'm just kidding. That was a horrible joke. <laughs> horrible joke. Terrible joke. Okay. A peanut in the throat or something. I was munching on some food before I came in. Okay. 1 Samuel chapter 3, please. Let me get us started in verse number 8 and then join me out loud, if you will, in verses 9 and 10. Please. The Bible says, The Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. And let's go verse 9 and 10, please. Ready? Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called at his other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then said Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Now keep your Bible open and look at verse number 19 together. And let me read verse 19 and join me on verse 20. And then we'll read the, after I read verse 21. Join me at the very, just the first phrase of the first verse of chapter 4. So let me pick up on verse 19, please. The Bible says, And Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Verse 20, please, ready? And all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And let's read that first phrase, verse number one, please. Ready? And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, bless your word now as it's preached. Bless your people, Lord. Thank you that we get to meet together. Lord, as, uh, Lord, as we adjust our church schedule and adjust our seating and adjust our giving and Adjust our fellowship a little for a while. Lord, still, you are in this place and you gather with us and you meet with us. Lord, we're so grateful that we have the Spirit of God. We're so grateful that, Lord, we may be at times at a distance, but we're ever near because of you. Lord, that we have one another. And greatest of all, Lord, that you go with us. You never leave us or forsake us. Lord, did you always watch over us. And, Lord, that nothing can separate us from your love because we're yours. Lord, bless now the music. Bless the preaching. Lord, bless as we go out and live what we hear in Christ's name. Amen. The angry crowd called out to crucify. They nailed him to a rugged cross and left him there to die. They gambled for the royal robes he wore, not knowing they had crucified my Lord. He bore the sin and shame for all mankind. And as he hung there dying, I was on his mind. His sacrifice and love some don't appreciate. But I would like to speak and set the record straight. That's my God, and I love him. That's my Jesus, he died for me. For all the world to hear, I'll say it loud and clear. That's my God, that's 
my God. Some say he's nothing more than a fairy tale, that he's just a myth or legend. His presence is not real. His word is not correct politically. They curse and mock his name defiantly. Oh, but time has never changed the changeless one. Their lies cannot disprove the existence of God's Son. Though some may be content to just sit by, I for one must stand and testify. That's my God, and I love him. That's my Jesus, he died for me. For all the world to hear, I'll say it loud and clear, that's my God, that's my God, and I love him. That's my Jesus, he died for me, for all the world to hear, I'll say my God, that's my God. For all the world to hear, I'll say it loud and clear, that's my God, that's my God. Amen. That's wonderful. And uh, bear with us. You noticed even on the online services that uh, we're, it's a work in progress. Sometimes you got background noise. Sometimes you got white noise. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it's crystal clear. Sometimes it's wonderful because you can barely see me. And other times I can, you can see me really well. And so these men are doing a tremendous job. And uh, we're working with the microphone here and doing a few things to try to adjust things to make things as good and comfortable and easy for you all to listen and, uh, and uh, enjoy the services as possible. Let me just say this. I'll go in and pick up some groceries, get a little of this or a little of that down at the HEB, and I've noticed that some managers are wearing masks and gloves, some aren't. Some cashiers are wearing masks, some aren't. Some other workers and, and people who are going in that are customers will and, will, and gloves and masks will wear them and, and some won't. And let me, under, let me uh, help you all to understand something. It's a, per, it's a personal preference. If we right now in the heart of downtown New York City, right now they would probably be sending us all off to jail for trying to have church. And number two, we'd probably all feel uh, urged to uh, wear masks, wear gloves, keep distance from others. And we're in an environment similar to maybe where there will be more people like there would be maybe at a grocery store or other place like that. So if you, uh, you say, well, it's one environment and more people are wearing masks than another. Envi and more people are wearing masks that aren't wearing masks. And maybe today in church, more people aren't wearing masks that are wearing masks. You should not feel uncomfortable coming to church because you're in the minority because you're not wearing a mask or gloves or because you're in the minority because you are wearing a mask and gloves. You ought to just be, feel like you're part of the majority because we're all together, amen? And that's how all of us should make each other feel and that's how all of us should feel and not feel any different than that. Let me go ahead and open our story this morning or our message this morning uh, on Mother's Day. A teacher gave her class uh, of second graders a lesson on a magnet. The next day she had a written test and she added a question and it said this. My full name has six letters. My first letter is M. I pick up things. What am I? The test papers were turned in and the teacher was astonished to find that almost 50% of the students answered the question with the word M-O-T-H-E-R instead of M-A-G-N-E-T. Mother was their answer. I'd like to come back to that story at the end of the message. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, I pray. 
Dear Lord, that you would use the message, use the sermon, use the truth, use this messenger. Most importantly, use your spirit and your word to, to make a difference this morning. Put me out of the way. Set me aside. As it was said of Samuel, I don't want even a word to fall to the ground. I want to say what should be said and not say what should not. Dear Lord, with the brief time that we have together, I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Brother Nate, I know we adjusted so that we could, so that I could hear a little better here and also hear a little better here like we did the other day. If we can adjust that just a touch so that I'm feeling a little bit more like we were, I would appreciate it. It's, right now it's a little more difficult to hear for myself, a little more difficult to hear than usual. And, uh, and so if you can uh, maybe take a look at that for us, that would be a blessing. It was the preacher Charles Spurgeon who said, those who think that a woman keeping her home is doing nothing are thinking the opposite of what is actually true. Far from nothing. She is doing the best possible service for her Lord. And mothers, the godly training of your offspring is your first and most pressing duty. That's an end quote. I also second the feelings of the Prince of Preachers when he was thinking of the value of his own mother's influence in his life when he said, I cannot tell you how much I owe to the solemn and devout words of my good mother. I'd like to propose to the church this morning, how much credit do mothers really deserve? How much credit do they deserve? We should give honor to whom honor is due, right? Can't we all this morning just admit most men are what their mothers made them to be? Can we just go ahead and admit that this morning? The father is away from home all day, doesn't even have half of the influence a child over a child that the mother da does. It was said that isn't it the cow, not the bull, that has most to do with the calf? Isn't it true that if a bad colt grows into a good horse, we all know who it was that combed that colt and cared for that colt. It was his mama. Isn't the mother that responsible person for which the bad or the good of her children very much depend? And may we not today make light of the responsibility of a father. May we not make light of that today. But may we also give honor to whom honor is due today. May we also make sure that we give a good reminder to each and every one of us of the credit that's really due to a mother. Like the gardener is to the garden, isn't the wife to the family? Wasn't it Hannah? As we go back to our passage this morning, and we're going to, I'm going to draw your attention to other verses that we did not read, but wasn't it Hannah, Samuel's mother? And I still can't, we're not quite back, Brother Nate, to where we were. Uh, to where what I'm trying to do, folks, is where I don't feel I have to strain my voice. Isn't that, wouldn't that be nice for you? And these men have just been working at this thing and doing a great job, and I think we're just about where we were, Brother Nate. Uh, the other day. It was Hannah, Samuel's mother, who made him a little coat every year as he continued to grow and brought it to the temple. But didn't she do a whole lot more for him before she gave him back to God? Before we get to the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4? Let's start at the beginning. Hannah was a wife favored and loved by her husband, Elkanah. And Hannah loved God. Don't, let's not miss that about the truth. Hannah loved the Lord. Hannah loved God. Uh, so God looked down and said, I need a man who can be to me, to Israel, a priest and a judge and a prophet. I need one man all rolled into one. I need one man to be a prophet and a priest and a judge. I need this man to do all of these things over the whole country. So I'll need to choose a very special woman to raise this child. I've got to choose a very special woman. So God looked down and chose Hannah. And what was the very first thing? Don't miss the truth this morning. What was the very first thing? What was the very first thing that God did before anything else? What did he do to mold Hannah into that great mother? What was the first thing God did to prepare Hannah to be that godly mother? You ready for this? He made it so she couldn't have children. In order for her to be the godly mother that she, God needed for her to be, to raise Samuel, to be the man that God needed for him to be, the very first thing God said, I need to do, is make it so she can't have children. He shut up her womb. He took away her ability to have children. How in the world would that prepare someone to be a better mother? I would say it's the most important thing God did for Samuel was to take away his mama's ability to rear and have, to bear children before, before he was born. The most important thing God did for Samuel. 
was to make it so his mama could not have kids. I met a young man while studying in my office yesterday. He was in complete despair. Young man, probably in his early 20s, late teens. He was on the ground, and he said, I feel as he's sitting on the sidewalk out there. He knocks on, I could hear some commotion out there. I go out, and uh, he's sitting on the ground. He said, I feel like the ground is falling from underneath me. He then told me the story how a young woman that he loved with all his heart and had given his life to now liked somebody else and not him. We stood there and prayed together. I encouraged him to seek the Lord and get close to God and love God with all his heart. And let God make a wonderful godly man out of him first. And let God fix his relationships and lead him and care for the relationships of his life. And God had to make something wonderful of Hannah first so that he could then make something wonderful of Samuel. Hannah had to learn to lean on God while other women scorned her and provoked her because she couldn't have children. She had to get past her shame and still go up to the house of God. God needed her to first learn to get things from Him and depend on Him for her needs. God needed her to so affected, so riveted, so shaken, so affected by, uh, by, by her childlessness that she would go into the house of God and could not eat. She refused to eat. And she would just go and meet with God and pray. God said, I've got to get her to that point. God needed her to learn to weep while she was barren and to fast and feel all the horrible grief in her spirit so she would one day be able to appreciate how great God would become in her life. God wanted her to know the bitterness of her soul and pray all those prayers and shed all those tears. And because with her God... All of it would lead to a very special and close relationship. The kind of relationship that Samuel would need to see in a mama. That Samuel would need to have with God himself if he would be that priest. If he would be that prophet. If he would be that judge over all of Israel. She learned to pour out her soul to God and to worship before the Lord. She got so dependent. Hannah got so dependent on God. So dependent on the Lord for everything that she said, God, if you give me a son, if you give me a child... If you give me a child, I'll give him back to you. That's how dependent she became. Once Hannah had finally learned in her barrenness what it took to hold on to God and nothing else, God finally said, I'll remember you. Now she's ready to be the mother that I need Sam for Samuel to have. Now she's ready. Even the great name Samuel. You ever studied the great name Samuel? What does the name Samuel mean? Samuel... That name was given him by his mother only because God first shut up her womb to get her spirit dependent on him and ready for motherhood. And once she passed all of God's tests, she knew then that it was only God who could have allowed her to have this child. And she said, I will name him Samuel. Why? I have asked him of the Lord. Of the Lord. Do you understand this morning that Samuel never would have become Samuel if Hannah wouldn't have become Hannah? Samuel would have never become Samuel if Hannah would not have become Hannah. It's time we give credit to whom credit is due and honor to whom honor. How much credit do mothers deserve? Let's be honest here today. Show us better men in the world and we'll have to admit that you'll have to show us better mothers. The world that knows a better generation of men will have to accept that it has a generation of better mothers to rear them. It takes the Sarahs first before the Isaacs. It takes the Rebekahs first before the Jacob. It takes the Sarahs and Rebekahs before there ever was an Isaac, before there ever could be a Jacob. We have almost always found that the Timothys of each generation have had the Loises and the Eunices. The mighty prophet Isaiah said, Can a woman forget her child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? I came across an amazing story. Amazing story of a mother's love for her child this week, and the, it was the winter of 1863. A young mother was making her way across the hills of South Wales, carrying her tiny little baby in her arms, just a newborn baby, when she was overtaken by a blizzard. She never reached her destination, and when the blizzard had subsided, her body was found by searchers beneath a mound of snow, and they discovered that before her death, she had taken off all of her outer garments. Her outer garments from head to toe were removed and she instead took that clothing and wrapped it around her baby. And when they unwrapped all the garments from around the little child to their surprise and joy, they found that the child was not only alive but alive and well. She had molded her body over his as the snow was falling. 
and given her life for her child, proving the depths of a mother's love. And 53 years later, that child grew into manhood and became not only a great statesman in the land of England, but was sworn in that year, 53 years later, as the newly elected prime minister of all of Great Britain. What was that little infant's name? You can look it up. David Lloyd George became in many ways a much better man. Not a perfect man. If you read about his life, not a perfect man. But in many ways a much better man, even though he never knew his mama, never remembered her face, never remembered her voice. He had learned one thing that stayed with him all the way till his own grave. His mother sacrificed her life for his. How much honor do mothers deserve? Honestly, I know in my life, it was the firm and loving mother's hand that made the man in my life. Your life story is not the same as mine, but I can only use mine. And so I'll do some of that this morning. Take children who grow up giving mother, mothers headaches and she chooses just to let them have their way. Then they grow up and they're the ones that give mom all the heartaches, right? Or can. That's the kind of power a mother has. Someone said this, foolish fondness spoils many. Leaving faults to themselves spoils much more. The wise gardener who said, the garden that is never weeded will grow very little worth gathering because all watering and no hoeing always makes a poor crop. A child can have too much of his mother's love and then in the end it turns out that he had too little of her love. Every one of us adults were once children and know this to be true. Soft-hearted mothers rear soft-headed children. Too soft-hearted without the firm hand. Mothers of a firm hand with their children don't get enough credit that they deserve. Soft-hearted mothers, they hurt them for life. They hurt their children for life because they're afraid to hurt them, that they might hurt them while they're young. A model co a mother coddles her children, and instead of turning out fresh produce, she turns out wet noodles. <laughs> I like that one. We'd all agree that it's the mother who makes the man, but truth be told, it's the loving and firm hand that makes the man. The old country preacher used to say it like this, you'll sugar a child till everybody gets sick of it. <laughs> you been there? He said this, boys' jackets need a little dusting every now and then, and girls' dresses are all the better with occasional trimming, and so it is with children. Children without correction and chastisement are no more than fields without plowing. Without plowing. Is there anything more necessary than the firm hand of a loving, godly mother? A horse trainer, they'll tell you this, the very best of colts want to be broken in. I like this. I added a little bit to it. Nobody likes cruelty. The cruel and cruel mothers are not mothers at all. And those who are always spanking and finding fault with their children ought to, ought to be spanked real good themselves. Amen. But thank God for the firm hand of a godly mother. If I ever crossed the line, this is all the way until I left the home. If I ever crossed the line in our home, it did not matter what it was about. Mom found out about it. How many of you have a mother like that? She's got eyes in the back of her head, eyes in the sides of her head. She's got ears that can hear farther than, than a human ought to be able to hear. She has a sense that, that I didn't know that God created man or woman with to be able to hear things and find out about things that there's no way she should know about. There's no way. And she would always call me out on it. I say always, always call me out on it. Bad language on the athletic field, she would call me out on it. But you know how my mother was? When I had bad language on the athletic field, she called me out from the bleachers in front of everybody that I called friend. Everybody, my own teammates, hanging out with friends past a certain hour, she called me out. Hanging out with the wrong kind of friends, called me out. Bad music in the house or anywhere where I was, called me out. I don't know for sure, I'm not speaking from experience, but my parents' denomination of churches with the, the Conservative Baptist Association didn't take the hardest line stance, I believe, possibly on separation from the world or preaching hard against Christian rock or Christian pop or country western or just normal non-Christian music. But do you know in our home while I was growing up, when mom or dad heard bad music playing in the house or in the car that didn't honor or glorify God, 
they took a very firm stand. I'd have a friend from school over. We'd be downstairs in the basement playing ping pong, and I'd crank up the rock and roll, right? I'd crank it up, and Mom would come downstairs and shut the music down. I mean, when I say down, I mean off. I mean take the player away. She has to. Or from the top of the steps, I would hear these words. Aaron, what are you listening to down there? You shouldn't be listening to that kind of music. Those were her exact words. I can hear her right now. Those, what are you listening to down there? You shouldn't be listening to that kind of music. I can hear her words now. They won't go away. Somebody help me. I never forgot that she kept a firm hand on me all the way to the end of my time and my years at home. I've never, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going to tell it to you because it's a true story. I'd never seen a bad movie before in my life. The kind of movie a Christian shouldn't watch, right? One with bad language in it, one with sex of any kind in it, whether the people are married or not. I knew that anything PG in our home across our television had to be approved by mom or dad. And anything worse than PG was out of the question, period. I knew the rules. I knew the rules. It was July 15th, 1988. Just like it was today or yesterday. July 15th, 1988. And if you know what that date stands for, we, please don't admit it. I'm admitting it for you and me. I had never been to a movie theater before in my life. 17 years old. I had just finished my junior year of high school. Our family were all over at one of our deacon and his wife. Dear, one of the godliest couples I've ever met in my life, brother and Mrs. Bill Deering's house. And we're over there enjoying some food and playing games and having a good time. And a buddy of mine from church shows up and asks if I want to go see a, a movie with him. Go watch the show. I looked my parents in the eye and they made me promise that I would not watch an R-rated movie. And from eyeball to eyeball, I promised them I would not. We get to the theater. I see the theater right now. We're on the sidewalk off of North Monroe Street, the Garland Theater. You can look it up. One of those old time, still today. There we are standing in line. My friend knew it. I knew it. We were there to see one show. One show. Die Hard. With Bruce Willis. <laughs> Had just come out in the theater. I mean, just come out. When I stood there and promised my parents, I knew I was lying to my parents. I knew I was lying in their face. I knew it was an R-rated movie. I knew that the language would be horrible. I knew that the language would be ungodly. I knew that the language would be filthy. I knew that the language would be unacceptable for any child of God. And if God wouldn't watch it, I already knew I had no business being there. I mean, at our house, the F word was not okay. The S word was not okay. The A word was not okay. The B word was not okay. Because it was slang for G-D, D-A-N-G was not okay. G-O-D, D-A-M-N was not okay. The word fudge was not okay because it was a slang word for S-C-R-E-W was not okay. C-R-A-P was not okay. Hell as a cuss word was not okay. Jesus used as a cuss word was not okay. Christ used as a cuss word was not okay. We all knew that it was not okay. We were all to avoid those words coming out of our mouths or going into our ears if it was in our power to avoid hearing them. We knew. <laughs> By the way, are there hardly any more popular blockbusters where in the big moments in the film some line isn't laced with just the worst, most horrible, filthy language anymore. Guess how long it took for my parents to find out where I'd been and what I'd done. Guess how many weeks. Did I say weeks? I meant days. Did I say days? I meant hours. Did I say after I got home? Oh, how about they found out before I got home? 
I destroyed their trust. I damaged our family name. I tore their hearts out. And thank God that after 17 and a half years of raising me, I still had a mama with a firm and loving hand. Praise the Lord. How much credit do mothers deserve? A good mother is very dear to her children. I feel this way. There's no mother in the world like my own mother. There's no mother in the world like mine, the one I have. I also feel this way. Every woman is a beautiful woman to her son. There's only one woman more beautiful to me in this world than mom. Did I get the right order, sweetheart? I see that lady. I see that lady in a picture. I see her in a video. I see her in person. Beautiful. Beautiful. What a woman my mother is. I found this quote from two centuries ago, back in the day when hanging criminals for terrible crimes was common. The quote goes like this, the man who does not love his mother is not even worthy of the effort of a hanging. I put in my notes, I kind of agree with that. Each of us ought to have a fondness, no matter what kind of mother we had, a fondness and a special love for the one who came near death to give us life. Honor to whom honor is. How much credit do mothers deserve? Is there anyone more blessed of God than a mother who leads her children to the Savior? What a privilege it is. Some of you maybe led your children to the Savior. Ladies who lead their little ones to Christ could be seen as, could be seen as the greatest of all their achievements. If you had that great joy, not always is it your joy, but if your children are saved, you have reward in the efforts that you've done with your children. I was, I was four years old in our little white three-bedroom house, little rancher house that we had in Pendleton, Oregon. I remember the moment, maybe you've heard the story before, I remember the moment where mom brought some of the other kids in from some of the neighborhood apartments and from the church, some of the other kids in, and she had her little Bible stories on flannel. When she got done, she had us bow our heads. And mom reminds me how that I prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. My mother holds that moment very dear as one of the highlights in her life, and she should. By the way, if you led your son to Christ as bad a sinner as this son was, that's a pretty good achievement right there. To bring a child into the world to care for and feed that child and then to lead that little one to the Savior. What an amazing privilege it is. Jesus, by the Bible says, blessed the children. Uh, they were blessed to come unto him, but Jesus blesses the mother as well. Happy, blessed are they among women who see their sons and their daughters walk in truth. How much credit do mothers deserve this morning? Anyone here think it's easy as a mother to raise up children? Every mother here today wants their child to turn out for God and wants their child to turn out right. Proverbs 31, verse 26, she opened her mouth with wisdom. Even the wisest in the world do not understand some of the wisdom that it takes that God gives the mother. As a teenager, I was a handful in our home. For a few years, I want to say two to three years, I was kind of a handful. How many of you have had children that were like this? You ready? How many of you were like this? Maybe you're getting it on the, uh, on the, on, on the uh, other end of things as a parent. Yielding to my parents' wishes was not my top priority. Doing God's will was only a small blip on my radar. I wanted my food. I wanted my sports. I wanted to be at church as little as possible. Because I had very few saved friends, and my best friends, even though our church ran, ran over 500 people, my best friends were on the baseball and basketball teams I played on. They were Mormon. They were Catholic. They were atheists. Maybe one or two saved, but I couldn't even this day tell you which ones were saved that I played sports with in high school. I wanted my nice physique. Praise the Lord, I haven't lost that. Uh, <laughs> I wanted my tan skin, I wanted my see-through t-shirts and my baseball scholarship offers, and not much of anything else mattered to me. I was going to be what I wanted to be. I was going to do what I wanted to do, and Dad was just to keep the money coming in and keep me in a vehicle, and Mama was just to keep the food coming in and keep me fed. I had to be the one getting all the laughs. 
I had to get the last word in. I was always right about any topic, whether I knew anything I was talking about or not. I needed to control everyone and everything around me. I always seemed to have something more important to say than anyone else doing the talking at any given time during waking hours of any given day. I. I was a real handful for my mother for about two years. I tried their patience many times and found out that almost as many times as I tried, they didn't have as much patience as I thought they did. I took them over the breaking point more than once. Mama, maybe you're here today. Mama, do all you can with certain children. And like me, like I was, no matter what dad did and mom did, sometimes that child just will not obey as they should. Keep doing your best. Keep giving it your all. Keep showing them the love of God. They won't always show the improvement that you wish. They don't, won't always follow and obey as they should. But praise the Lord, Mama stood up to me and didn't back down. Praise the Lord, she loved me too much and believed in me too much to give in and let me win. She knew she had a sinner on her hands. She knew that you can wash a dog, comb its hair, and yet that dog is still just a dog. Trouble in life is meant to drive us closer to God, but some trouble seems like it's wasted. I wonder, I've never asked my mother this, I've wondered if, I've wondered if my mother ever felt like all the effort she was giving to me, some of it was wasted effort. Let me say to the mamas this morning, it is never wasted on your children. Never. You ever feel that way? All the trouble is just wasted. Being a mother is not easy. To all the mothers, may I say this morning, don't give up on yourself, mama. Amen. I said, mama, don't give up on yourself. Solomon failed. He had more wisdom than we'll ever have. He failed. He made mistakes. His children didn't always turn out, all, all turn out so good. Mama, don't give up on you and your, and your relationship with your God and what God, is, you, God has placed you in this world as a mother. Don't give up on yourself and don't give up on your children no matter how old they are, no matter where they are. And many mama looks at a child and feels like a failure as a mama. Many mothers feel like they failed. They look at their own mistakes and their own faults, and sometimes they wonder why they even try. Why even try anymore? Mama, you're not perfect, but you have tried, and you love your children, so keep on trying and keep on loving them. Keep on with that firm hand. Keep on with that example. Mama, you're not perfect. Keep on trying. Keep on believing. Keep on loving. You love your children. Because you are not perfect, Father, because you are not perfect, neither are your children. Whatever faults our children have, we are their parents. Dad is their parent. Mom is their parent. The farmer would say, wild geese don't lay no domestic eggs now. That which is born of a hen is going to scratch in the dust just like mama does. The child of a cat will go after those mice. It's what they all do. Every creature follows after its kind. That's what we do. And mama, you're a sinner. Keep believing in you and what God is doing with you and God's will for you. And keep on loving that child. You may have another Aaron Baxter on your hands who for a couple of years may be rebellious, may be disobedient, may not want to listen, may always want to interrupt you sometimes because they think what you're going to say before you even say it and before they even get to the end of the sentence and they think they're real smart. You may have another Aaron Baxter on your hands who today is not perfect but today wants God to use him, today wants to live for God, today wants to please the Lord, today wants to stay in God's will, today wants to find God's will and do it with all his might, today still loves his Bible, today Today still loves his wife. Today still loves his children. Today still loves being a family man. Today doesn't, doesn't have any desire to seek any other kind of life. You may have another Aaron Baxter on your hands as a young lady or a young man, but don't quit on you and don't quit on thinking what you've been doing hasn't been working. Realize that there may come a day where that son or that daughter, the 
They will not forget all that you've done and all the investment, all the effort that you've made. Don't quit on you. Keep doing your best, Mama. Let's keep on praying that the good Lord will put his hand to the plow and do what we can't do. And do what sometimes we wish we could, but we're not able to do. Always remember, Mama, the Mama who weeps for her children before God will one day sing and see the hand of God in the life of her children. I like this statement. As I finish this morning, it's the cult who breaks the ropes of the halter with his power and rips that halter from its head so it cannot be led and steered that can still one day become that quiet horse in the harness. God can make those children brand new whom we cannot mend. My parents, I think, as they see that I'm in church, that I study the Bible, I preach the Bible, I love people, I'm trying to do God's will for my life. My parents, I promise you, look back and they can testify that it was worth, it's always worth the effort. We not, do, do not know what God will do when God can make children brand new when we cannot mend. So never despair of your children, mother, as long as you live. As long as you live. And in some cases, children do not despair of your parents. Don't quit on your parents. Parents don't quit on your children, but children don't quit on your parents because they're not perfect, because they fall short, because they disappoint you. Mama, don't quit on your son. Son, don't quit on mama. Daddy, don't quit on your daughter. Daughter, don't quit on uh, daddy. Parents and children, don't quit on each other. Uh, don't despair of your family. Don't despair of your children, mama. As long as you live, don't despair. Are your children distant from you? Are they away from you? Have they, has their spirit wandered from you or from the Lord? Remember always that the Lord is there where they are, and the Lord is here with you where you are, and the Lord hears you, and the Lord can work where they are where, while God hears your prayers and God hears and sees your tears and sees your weeping and sees your care and sees your love and sees your heart. Maybe your child is what we call the prodigal child. Always know that the prodigal can wander, but the heavenly father, that prodigal is always in the father's sight, no matter how far off they are. I end with this. May each mother be reminded once again today, labor to make your home the happiest place on earth. Mama, labor to make your home the happiest place on earth. Turn loose of nagging, grumbling about life, those things that cause your hold on your children to loosen. For it's the good mother who is the soul of that home. It's the smile of a mother's face that can still draw a child onto a godly path. I end with this. And then one other thing here, and then I've got a little story to tell. And then I've got that final illustration to get back to. Would you hear this statement before I go back to our original illustration? Do you remember... Maybe you've heard this before. The boy with the heart of iron. That was me. Heart of iron. Not going to listen. Don't care. Don't care what you think. Don't care what college you think I have to go to or consider going to. Not going to take your advice. Not going to take your advice on who, who I have in my relationships. Not going to take your advice on what college I'm going to go to. Not going to even ask you, give you the opportunity to talk and to share your, give counsel. I'm going to listen to what I want to listen to. I'm going to have the friends I want to have. But it says this. The statement is this. The boy with the heart of iron can still have a mother who can hold him close like a magnet. My full name has six letters. The first one is M. 
I pick up things. What am I? They were supposed to say magnet. They said mothers. To every mother today, please forgive us for failing to give you the credit you really deserve. Mamas have been picking up after the rest of us, haven't they? Mamas, you've been picking up after us for a long time. I'm sure you have. We ask you to forgive us for failing to give you the credit you really do deserve. As those flowers just starting to bud now, may our thanks to you also find themselves at the early stages of their bloom. May our thanks to the mothers in our life still be at the early stages of bloom and how we appreciate what they've done for us. Bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for each and every mama today. Thank you for church. Lord, thank you for a godly mother. We all have a different mama. But Lord, you know what you're doing. I thank God for so many things in my life. I, th I go back, Lord, and I think of what kind of a life my mama had as a little girl. As I thought about Hannah not being able to have children, then I thought back to my own mama and how she had to be a mama to her younger and older sisters because her mama wasn't a mama at all to any of them. And the burden that she carried and the, the having to grow up as a 12 and 13 year old girl and taking on responsibilities that she should never have had and all of the hurt and all of the tears and all of the heartache and all of the, 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 the not being able to cry on a mama's shoulder and really have a mama. And Lord, how I benefited from that. I benefited from the pain and the hurt that my mother felt before I became her son. May each of us today re-examine our hearts and Father, ask ourselves the question, how much honor and praise does mama really deserve? How much honor do they get? How much do they deserve? Dear Lord, bless, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me to your feet, please? Stand as the music plays. Who wouldn't have an invitation? Have it right there in your seat, if you will. But if you're not saved this morning, if you do not know if you're going to heaven or not, I'd like for you to do this. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We'll have the invitation music, please, one more time. Let me ask you this simple question. Do you know for sure that your sins are forgiven? Do you know for sure that your name is written in heaven? If you died right now, do you know that heaven is your home? Do you remember where you got saved? Do you know that you're born again? 